Chapter 18 His Mark As we were walking down the end of the wharf toward the ship, Queequeg carrying his harpoon, Captain Peleg, in his gruff voice, loudly hailed us from his wigwam, saying he had not suspected my friend was a cannibal, and furthermore announcing that he let no cannibals on board that craft unless previously produced their papers. What do you mean by that, Captain Peleg, said I, now jumping up on the bulwarks and leaving my comrades standing on the wharf? I mean, he replied, he must show his papers. Yes, said Captain Bildad in his hollow voice, sticking his head from behind Peleg's out of the wigwam. He must show that he's converted. Son of darkness, he added, turning to Queequeg, art thou at present in communion with any Christian church? Why, said I, he's a member of the First Congregational Church. Here be it said that many tattooed savages sailing in Nantucket ships at last come to be converted into the churches. First Congregational Church, cried Bildad, what, that worships at Deacon Deuteronomy Coleman's meeting house? And so saying, taking out his spectacles, he rubbed them with his great yellow bandana handkerchief and putting them on very carefully, came out of the wigwam and leaning stiffly over the bulwarks, taking a good long look at Queequeg. How long hath he been a member, he then said, turning to me. Not very long, I'd rather guess, young man. No, said Peleg, and he hasn't been baptized right either. It would have been washed some of that devil's blue off his face. Do tell now, cried Bildad. Is this Philistine a regular member of Deacon Deuteronomy's meeting? I'd never seen him going there, and I pass it every Lord's Day. I don't know anything about Deacon Deuteronomy or his meeting, said I. All I know is that Queequeg here is a born member of the First Congregational Church. He's a deacon himself, Queequeg is. Young man, said Bildad sternly, thou art skylarking with me. Explain thyself, thou young Hittite. What church dost thee mean? Answer me. Finding myself thus hard pushed, I replied, I mean, sir, the same ancient Catholic church to which you and I and Captain Peleg there and Queequeg here and all of us and every mother's son and soul of us belong. The great and everlasting first congregation of this whole wor worshipping world. We all belong to that. Only some of us cherish some queer crotchets. No way is touching the grand belief in that we all join hands. Splice, thou meanst splice hands, cried Peleg, drawing near. Young man, you'd better ship for a missionary instead for a foremast hand. I never heard a better sermon. Deacon Deuteronomy, why, Father Mapple himself couldn't beat it, and he's reckoned something. Come aboard, come aboard, never mind about the papers. I sail... Say, tell Quahog there, that's what you call him. Tell Quahog to step along by the great anchor. What a harpoon he's got there. Looks good stuff that he handles it about right. I say, Quahog, or whatever your name is, did you ever stand in the head of a whaleboat? Did you ever strike a fish? Without saying a word, Queequeg, in his wild sort of way, jumped upon the bulwarks and from thence to the bows of one of the whaleboats hanging to the side. And then, bracing his left knee, poising his harpoon, cried out in such a way as this. Captain, you see him small drop of tar on the water there? You see him? Well, suppose him one whale eye. Well, then, taking his sharp aim at it, he darted the iron right over old Bildad's broad brim, clean across the ship's deck, and struck the glistening tar spot out of sight. Now, said Queequeg, quietly hauling in the line, suppose he him whale eye. Why, that whale dead. Quick bag, Bildad, said Peleg, his partner, who, aghast at the close vicinity of the flying harpoon, had retreated towards the cabin gangway. Quick, I say, you, Bildad, and get the ship's papers. We must have Hedgehog, I, there, I mean Quahog, as one of our boats. Look ye, Quahog, we'll give you the 19th lay, and that's more than ever was given a harpooner yet out of Nantucket. So down we went in the cabin, and to my great joy, Queequeg was soon enrolled among the same ship's company to which I myself belong. When all preliminaries were over and Peleg had got everything ready for signing, he turned to me and said, I guess Quahog there don't know how to write, does he? I say, Quahog, blast ye, dost thou sign thy name or make thy mark? But at this question, Queequeg, who had twice or thrice before taken part in similar ceremonies, looked no ways abashed, but taking the offered pen, copied upon the paper in the proper place, an exact counterpart of a queer round figure, which was tattooed upon his arm so that Captain Peleg's obstinate mistake touched his appellative. It soon stood something like this. Quahog, his X mark. Meanwhile, Captain Bildad sat earnestly and steadfastly eyeing Queequeg, and at last solemnly and fumbling in the large pockets of his broad-skirted drab coat, 
took out a bundle of tracts, selecting one entitled The Latter Day Coming or No Time to Lose, placed it in Queequeg's hand, and then grasping them in the book with both of his, looked earnestly into his eyes and said, Son of darkness, I must do my duty by thee. I am part owner of this ship and feel concern for the souls of all its crew. If thou clingst to thy pagan ways, which I sadly fear, I beseech thee. Remain not, for I a bit belial bondsman. Spurn the idle bell and the hideous dragon. Turn from the wrath to come. Mind thine eye, I say. O oh, goodness gracious, steer clear of the fiery pit. Something of the salt sea yet lingered in old Bildad's language, heterogeneously mixed with scripture and domestic phrases. Avast there, avast ye, Bildad, avast now spoiling our harpooner, cried Peleg. Pious harpooners never make good voyagers. It takes the shark out of them. No harpooner is worth straw who ain't petty, sh who ain't pretty sharkish. There was young Nat Swain, once the bravest boatheader out of Nantucket in the vineyard. He joined the meeting and never came to good. He got so frightened about his plaguey soul that he shrinked and sheared away from whales for fear of afterclaps, in case he got stove and went to Davy Jones. Peleg, Peleg, said Bildad, lifting his eyes and hands. Thou thyself, as I myself, has seen many a perilous time. Thou knowest, Peleg, what it is to have the fear of death. How then canst thou prate in this ungodly guise? Thou beliest thine own heart, Peleg. Tell me, when this same Pequag here had had her th three masts overboard in that typhoon on Japan, that same voyage when thou went mate with Captain Ahab, didst thou not think of death and the judgment then? Hear him, hear him now, cried Peleg, marching across the cabin and thrusting his hands far down into his pockets. Hear him, all of ye, think of that. When every moment we thought the ship would sink, death and judgment then, what? With all three masts making such an everlasting thundering against the side and every sea breaking over us fore and aft? Think of death and judgment then? No, no time to think about death then. Life was what Captain Ahab and I was thinking of, and how to save all hands, how to jury-rig masks, how to get into the nearest port, that was what I was thinking of. Bildad said no more, but buttoning up his coat, stalked on deck where we followed. There he stood, very quietly overlooking some sailmakers who were mending a topsail in the waist. Now and then he stopped to pick up a patch and save an end of tarred twine, which otherwise might have been wasted. This is the end of chapter 18. Quahog. Quahog. I said quahog again, didn't I? Multiple times. Quahog. Quahog. Okay. I'm just terrible with saying quahog instead of quahog. Which is sad because I can pronounce Bahaba right. Anyway, Quahog. Couldn't say Queequeg, said Quahog. Hedgehog. Um, it's important to get somebody's name right. Uh, it's kind of a sign of disdain if you don't. And people in different places have mighty strange names. And uh, people from different countries have mighty strange names. At least to ours, ears. And, you know, it's difficult for them to pronounce some of our names, you know. My name is Mark Lively. Two English words. Um, had a summer job. I worked with a bunch of people from Laos. Now, Laos is a country in East Asia, uh, next to Vietnam. And Laotians, like many countries in Asia don't precisely have an R and don't precisely have an L. They have a letter that's eh, somewhat in between them. And because it's somewhat in between them, Mark Lively comes out, Mark Rivery. It's the R's and the L's are just all over the place. Um, I had some problems with Laotian names. I did my best and they were okay with it. Um, so, yeah, getting somebody's name is important. You know, they were calling him Hedgehog. They were calling him Quahog. Um, Qua. Qua. Why am I always on Quahog? Quahog. They kept calling him Quahog. I'm going to have to, like, write that down. Quahog. 
Uh, I'm terrible with that. Uh, anyway, call them Quahog. So that's, uh, it's, it's important to get somebody's name right. And it can actually be used as a sign of disdain for somebody if, uh, if you intentionally get their name wrong. And I will admit there is a time where I've intentionally gotten a name wrong. And that is in Star Wars, where when I talk about Princess Amidala, I say amygdala. And the amygdala is the part of the brain deep inside that deals with emotion and fear. And so I, it's it's my disdain for the character. Uh, the actress who portrayed her was quite fine, is an excellent actress, um, Natalie Portman. But the character is just utterly forgettable. So it's instead of Queen Amidala, it's Queen Amygdala. But uh, try and get people's name right. Also, also, it was, and thing was, his mark. The name of this chapter is his mark. And Queequeg made his mark in the, in the book. He drew a circle and kind of a shaded in square, which was a tattoo that he had on his arm. So that may be a pictographic representation of his name in his land, where he's from. Uh, it could be, you know, it could be a symbol that he picked for himself. Uh, is like, okay, this is a tattoo that, this is a mark that represents me. Uh, it probably isn't an alphabetic language because there aren't, just about all of the alphabetic languages seem to have evolved once in Mesopotamia, and it just kind of spread from there. Uh, actually, no, that's wrong. Korean is alphabetic. Uh, Japanese picked up an alphabet from... I can't remember when they picked it up. But that was a relatively late invention for both Korea and Japan to have alphabets. Um, before they were kind of pictographic languages, and the king of Korea was like, this is stupid, this takes too long to write. We're going to have this simple alphabet. And so he just, by diktat, said, boom, this is a Korean alphabet. Uh, which was kind of cool. But anyway, he made his mark. And back at this time, a lot of people weren't literate. Literacy, being able to write, is a... Or everybody being able to write is a relatively new thing. So typically what people would do is they would just make an X to say, this is my mark, and I... and they might make it in a slightly different way or they might recognize the document and say, yes, this is my mark on it. And it may not necessarily be an X, but an X was a very common thing. So it's like, okay, yes, I agree to this. I sign my name to the contract, though if, you know, people aren't reading the contract, don't understand the contract, does it really make sense to have them sign it? You know, you explain it to them, but, you know, if you lie in the explanation, and you know, that's not what I agreed to. It's your mark on it. And so, once again, your pops cannot pronounce Quahog. Hey, pops, how about horse brands? Horse brands? Yes. Pops. That is, that's true, Lolly. Has a point there, horse brands. So, uh, cattle, horses, livestock in the, well, it used to, it started out in the Wild West, and perhaps even before, but uh, it was very common in the Wild West. It's still common now, where if you have a large amount of cattle roaming free, or horses roaming free, you would brand them. You would take a piece of hot iron in whatever shape represents your ranch. And you would heat it up till it's like glowing hot and you would stamp it on the hide of the animal and the animal would be burned and it would be very unpleasant for the animal, but it would leave a scar. And the scar would be in the shape of, you know, whatever the brand represents the, uh, Bar S. Bar, S, Bar S is, was Philmont. So Bar S was the Philmont brand. So that's an S with a bar over the top. Roy Rogers, singing Cowboy, had a brand for his ranch. And it was two R's back-to-back, -back, so one was flipped, 
with an bar over the top. So it was the double R bar ranch. So RR for Roy Rogers. And, it, you know, RR was his brand with a bar over the top to signify it being different than someone else who just had two R's. And you would have like a W or you would have a crown or you would have some shape that is distinctive. The Rocking J, the um, the King Ranch in Texas was kind of this W with wings sticking out. Um, you actually can see that on branded pickup trucks. Uh, I can't remember which branded pickup trucks did a King Ranch version. Now the King Ranch in Texas is huge. It takes up a full county and in Texas that's not a small thing. Um, it's actually, I think, bigger than Rhode Island. So imagine somebody's personal ranch being bigger than a state. And that's why it was impressive enough to have its own brand of truck. So that is Quee Quag making his mark, being called Quahog. Quahog. Uh, I'm sorry, Quahog terrible with pronouncing it. And that is the end of chapter 18.